Okay. So hello everyone and welcome to the webinar, The Geopolitics of Economic Self-Reliance, co-organized by the Mossavar Center for Government and Business and the Belfer Center, both at the Harvard Kennedy School. My name is Eduardo Campanella. I'm a senior fellow here at HKS, and it's a great pleasure for me to moderate um, this panel on a topic that is uh, becoming increasingly hot. The supply disruption caused by COVID-19 and then exacerbated by the Ukraine war are pushing uh, slowly and gradually pushing towards economic self-reliance. China was moving in that direction even before the outbreak of the pandemic. Self-reliance is an interesting concept uh, because it's different from uh, pure protectionism. Its goal is not to damage a trading partner, but to build uh, domestic resilience. It's um, in a way an inward looking strategy and not an outward looking one. So at least in theory, it is potentially less dangerous. It will be interesting uh, during our conversation to see whether this is really the case uh, uh, or not. Today we are joined by three prominent members of the Harvard community who will help us understand better the phenomenon. Larry Summers, professor at HKS, former Harvard president, and among many other things, uh, former secretary, secretary treasury during the uh, uh, Clinton administration. Meg Rittmeyer, uh, a China expert and a professor of business administration at HBS, and Jeffrey Frankel, a well-known economist and professor at HBS. Um, our conversation will be split in three parts. We first look at the economics of the problem, then the geopolitics, and then we will wrap up picking a question from the audience. So we are glad to see that there are more than 80 people connected. You are allowed to drop your question in the chat. So, uh, and then I will pick it uh, uh, at, at, at a later stage. So maybe Jeffrey, uh, we can start uh, uh, from you. Um, one of the most obvious risks associated with uh, self-reliance is increased uh, international polarization. Uh, the IMF in, in the latest World Economic Outlook uh, devotes a tiny paragraph uh, to a scenario where the world is divided in regional blocks with their own trade technological standards. A few days ago, uh, Janet Yellen talked about friend shoring that is moving production out of hostile countries into friendly nation. So it's a sort of regional self-reliance. Uh, can, uh, can you explain us whether you believe in this fragmentation scenario and or whether it is just uh, a temporary blip in the globalization process? Well, uh, thank you for inviting me, Eduardo, and for uh, the privilege of going first and for those questions. Um, let me start by just uh, recalling what's, what's very familiar to all of us, the uh, disruptions of the last five years. Um, there was Donald Trump and his trade wars. There was uh, Brexit. There was a pandemic. There was an economic recovery that ran into supply chain constraints. And there's the effects of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. These five have uh, something in common. Each of them, I believe it's fair to say, was completely unexpected a uh, year, year or two in advance. And each of them could be readily associated with the reversal of a long-term trend of globalization, increased uh, integration of goods markets and other markets, which had previously appeared to be unstoppable. Um, to answer your question, I think that uh, we are in a, in a medium run in a period where globalization integration trend is in abeyance. I think eventually it'll be uh, restored, but it could be a while. It could even be uh, the precedent, to, I hesitate to say it, but it's the interwar years. That's the only other time in the last two centuries when we've seen such a reversal of the trend towards, uh, towards global integration. I have in mind the three aspects which I think fit your, your, uh, the, the premise of this uh, seminar that you've, as you've designed it. Uh, the disadvantages of long supply chains have now become apparent, much more apparent than they were a while ago. As a result, uh, and partly as a result, the ratio of trade to GDP has fallen in the US, globally, and, and China is a huge part of this story, but I'll leave that to others. 
Um, third, firms seem to be switching from lean inventories under the just-in-time strategy to the higher levels of inventories under a just-in-case strategy, opting for more resilience even at the cost of some loss in efficiency. I like this, your phrasing of the trade-off between efficiency and resilience. That story is becoming quite familiar. I think it's probably right, but I want to add a, a wrinkle. I think the break in these trends came earlier, um, as evidenced by th three statistics, uh, one for each of the trends. The trade to GDP ratio had risen very sharply. It had increased from 10% approximately after World War II to 60% by 2008, but then it peaked and it's been on a downward trend uh, since 2008, 9, 10. Uh, second, uh, as of 2008, the U.S. inventories to sales ratio had been on a downward trend for several decades, but that bottomed out and, uh, around 2010 and has been on an upward trend uh, since then. Third, uh, various measures of uh, firm participation in uh, global supply chains uh, there's a re recent paper from the World Bank and one from the uh, authors of the IMF. They also suggest that there was increased uh, participation by firms in global supply chains, longer supply chains, but that that peaked, uh, presumably ran into diminishing returns uh, in uh, also around 2010, roughly, and has been on a, a reversal uh, since then. So um, I, I think uh, we've only been talking so much about global supply chains uh, since we ran into these uh, uh, snarls uh, in the last co couple of years. But I think a reasonable explanation uh, for this the turnaround in all three, uh, all three trends, I, and I, I think I don't, I, this is a good area for research. I don't think we know the reason, uh, but a good uh, reasonable explanation is that supply chains had run in, had matured, had run into diminishing returns by uh, roughly uh, 10 years ago uh, or more. And uh, the big shocks, starting with the global financial crisis, of course, in 2008, 2009, um, revealed the uh, vulnerability of the long supply chains and the dependence on suppliers uh, abroad. And that uh, firms have been reacting to that ever since. And the events of the last five years are just uh, amplifying that. So thanks a lot, uh, uh, Jeffrey, for this uh, global overview. If I may add to uh, the points that you highlighted, uh, the factors that are driving this reversal in globalization, uh, I think uh, China is clearly uh, a key uh, component uh, because we are assisting to a sort of withdrawal, gradual withdrawal of China from uh, uh, the global economy. Uh, Self-reliance is a relatively new concept in the West. Uh, it was uh, pretty dominant uh, in the Chinese political debate. It has been pretty dominant in the Chinese uh, political debate for quite some time. So <clears throat> you can think about uh, the um, uh, dual circulation strategy whose goal is basically to insulate the Chinese market from uh, global forces. So Meg, since uh, you know China extremely well, can you uh, give us a sense of why uh, President Xi Jinping is uh, promoting self-reliance and what he wants to achieve, at, at least from econ an economic point of view? Sure. Well, thanks for having me. And it's a pleasure to be here with Larry and Jeff. And I'm, 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 I think some of what I'm going to say is the same tone of what, um, of what uh, Jeffrey just said about um, how some of the trends of self-reliance and some of the kind of um, unraveling of the extreme vertical disintegration we've seen in the past 30 years really predated the COVID crisis. So from the Chinese perspective, indeed, um, the global financial crisis was uh, a big wake up call as the kind of fragility of external demand and the extent of the economy's reliance on external demand, which is also very geographically concentrated in kind of certain areas of China. And so you saw in 2008, 2009, a very high unemployment rate on the, China, on the Southeast China coast and a rapid drop right, in GDP which temporarily was filled by you know, investment, infrastructure investment and construction and things like that. But it had been a long time really that Chinese policymakers had been trying to stimulate internal consumption and domestic demand as a key driver of a more sustainable driver um, of economic growth over a long period of time. And so 
part of it was just this general desire that had been uh, on the minds of the, the, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, for some time that, you know, dom that domestic self-reliance on demand, right, as a driver of economic growth was desirable. And then there's a separate trend, really, which ends up galvanizing, I think, um, the self-reliance debate and the discussions that you just referenced which is really a sense that uh, not only had China relied on external demand, but basically that the contributions of, the, of, of China in these global supply chains were at the low value add part of the supply chain. So if you look at you know, anything from kind of semiconductors to electronics, you know, what you see is that the highest value add part coming from you know, digital screen makers in, in Korea, et cetera, whereas China's doing the assembly, the final export processing. And so, even before the financial crisis in 2006, you start to have Chinese policymakers coming up with what was this long, medium and long-term plan in 2006 for kind of scientific development, domestic R&D, domestic um, tech, kind of tech development and reliance. And then um, there's a real turning point actually in 2013 and 2014 in China with the Snowden revelations, both of the US um, deployment of a cyber weapon, the Stuxnet virus, but also the revelation that the, the National, Security, National Security Agency, the NSA had, had breached Huawei servers by putting a backdoor into a Cisco chip. And so you had this um, uh, several letters and several professional associations in China starting to get behind the idea of it's unsustainable to rely on you know, foreign input, foreign semiconductors, foreign mainframe computers, foreign data processors for key parts of the Chinese economy. And that if, the, if China wanted to move beyond kind of middle income into a high income technological powerhouse economy, that they needed to domesticate some of these capabilities. And so the means of doing that coalesced in 2015 with a campaign, and I'll say what I mean by a campaign in a moment, um, but a campaign called Made in China 2025, um, which we all heard a lot about and then stopped hearing about because indeed the propaganda of kind of domesticating supply chains, China going it alone, not relying on the West wasn't received very well in the United States or in other places. But it was a campaign, uh, which in China means, you know, something that is not necessarily very specific as a policy, but a set of, of very overarching goals and a high degree of mobilization from all parts of the Chinese economy and the Chinese polity to achieve those goals. And so specifically what Made in China 2025 did was identify, this was 2015, identify 10 priority frontier technology sectors, some of which you know, we, we recognize um, uh, kind of AI, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, semiconductors being the most you know, famous and the most consequential in the short term and develop what were called government guidance funds, um, which exist at all levels, in the central level, at the provincial level, at the municipal level. And the estimates are that it's about, about 10 trillion renminbi going into these funds um, at all levels. And they're, they're managed in a unique way where you have kind of private equity or even venture capital firms managing them on behalf of the state with, um, with kind of LPs that come from the financial sector in China from the non-state. The effect of all of this is this massive infusion of state capital throughout the Chinese economy, and especially in high tech sectors, which, you know, from from the viewpoint of the American government or even you know Korean government, Taiwanese government, Israelis, et cetera, almost all of these frontier sectors can be designated as dual use, meaning that they have both commercial and military applications. And so once you have this this massive blurring of boundaries between where, you know, innovation in the Chinese economy and private sector firms are, and then where the state is um, in terms of both capital and corporate governance. All of this generated a reaction, right, on the part of governments all over the world, where you see in 2018, which again, it really predates a lot of the, even at the end of the Obama administration, we started to have the use of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, the CFIUS, to block acquisitions of, of critical firms and, and high technology sectors in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and that predates Trump's you know, election overall. And so this sense that um, the move for self-reliance in China, which was a reaction to China's own perceived insecurity, then generated this insecurity of governments abroad. And so, and then of course the reaction to that has been indeed cutting off supply chains to China and things like that, which are only generating this kind of spiral of a crisis. And so from the Chinese perspective, Indeed, it predates the pandemic, but we're seeing an acceleration of trends that had been had been there in the Chinese economy for quite some time and that are rather self-fulfilling, tragically, um, in the way that the policies have been implemented and received abroad.
Thanks a lot, uh, Meg. Uh, now it may be interesting to look preci precisely at uh, the other side of the coin, so the Western perspective. So you mentioned that uh, this uh, uh, move towards self-reliance for China trigger reaction elsewhere, and, and probably the pandemic and the war now in Ukraine uh, are uh, really accelerating uh, uh, the trend. Uh, Larry, uh, a few uh, months ago, uh, you, um, you, you argued that the, the US should uh, develop industrial capacity shifting from, as uh, Jeffrey mentioned, uh, just-in-time logistic to just-in-case uh, uh, resilience. And this is probably a strategy that can be applied also to other advanced economies. Can you explain us uh, what you have in mind and how far this strategy can be pushed without causing excessive costs such as higher inflation or disruption to global value chains? Um, let me first just say that I'm glad to be on this panel, that I've already learned a lot from what uh, Jeff said and what uh, Meg said that uh, there are a variety of topics where I have uh, very confident views and don't expect that it's likely that I'll change my mind over the next few months. Uh, this is not one of those uh, topics and it's one that I approach with uh, quite considerable uh, uncertainty, um, Edward. I think there are some questions that would be valuable for people to study involving um, some adjustments around uh, some of these measures that we look at. If the relative price of manufactured goods falls and there's the same level of trade in manufacturing as there was before, then the share of trade that is manufactured, the share of global trade will um, tend to uh, go down. Adjustments of that kind apply with respect to many kinds of figures. So I think there's a research agenda for the people listening to this call around measuring with care a good deal of what's happened uh, in terms of these uh, trends. I think it's inevitable that companies will make decisions. I mean, if you go back to Coase's theory on the existence of firms. It essentially has to do with the advantages of markets versus the advantages of um, reliability, reliability of suppliers and the avoidance of holdup problems. And as conditions change, you would expect the extent of vertical integration and the extent of boundaries uh, to change. I would be quite interested in the question on which I've never seen data, whether the length of purely domestic supply chains has also changed. To what extent are firms more vertically integrated? Is this phenomenon that we're observing a phenomenon related to globalization or related more to the nature of production uh, technologies. I think that's a very important question for thinking uh, about this. I think that um, you distinguished between self-reliance and protectionism. Um, and I think you were right to do that. And I think that there's a different, there is a difference. On the other hand, I think the former can often be used as a cloak for the latter. I think the vast majority of economists would agree that uh, the domestic production oriented policies of the Nehru administration in post-war India were very costly for Indian economic growth. And those policies were justified heavily around an ethos of self-reliance. So I think one needs to be careful about self-reliance being adopted as a rationale when the rationale is of uh, protection. I've said more generally that 
I think the best generals tend to be the ones who hate war the most. And in the same way, the best industrial policy uh, proponents and executors tend to be the ones with the most rather than the least uh, respect uh, for uh, markets. And so I am always nervous when I hear people say, we need to be more resilient. And by the way, it'll create a lot of new American jobs. Um, because that jobs rationale is actually a fairly protectionist uh, thing. I think it's also important when one thinks about the issues of self-reliance or resilience to think about all the various tools that can be uh, pursued. Taking direct control of one's own production is one strategy. There are, it seems to me, at least three others. The accumulation of uh, larger stockpiles of uh, inventory, the diversification of one's uh, supply chain so as to avoid uh, complete dependence on any one source, and the establishment of norms that um, permit uh, more, uh, that make it more counterintuitive, more contrary to start interfering uh, with uh, supply, uh, with uh, supply chains. Um, I think while there's enormous focus on um, supply chains at this moment, if I think about what the largest resilience issues for the global economy are right now, they're probably around energy prices, they're probably around the coming increase in uh, food prices. And they're probably around the issue where those two things are linked, which is fertilizer prices. None of those issues involve uh, long supply chains and self-resilience. Indeed, part of what has been striking is that the US economy has seen really very dramatic increase in the sales of goods in the last year and a half, far greater than anybody would have imagined. And yes, it has of course led to, led to higher prices, but I'm not sure what one should have been impressed by in the post COVID period was the shortness of uh, supply chains rather than the efficacy of uh, this system in re-switching and uh, re-engineering re um, its, uh, itself. You know, the lesson of the Galbraith review of uh, strategic bombing in Germany was that it was actually harder to undermine resilience by hitting at key nodes than the authors and advocates of those policies had supposed. Now, of course, a lot has changed in the last uh, 70 uh, years, but I am not quite as certain here as uh, all of this uh, rhetoric would suggest. I would also suggest that to the extent that the United States is the largest possessor of know-how, broadly defined. Broadly defined to include specific technologies and intellectual property. Also broadly defined in the sense of Pogliani uh, to refer to tacit knowledge of production processes and so forth. It's far from clear to me that promoting a generalized ethos of self-reliance in the world is serving our interest in maximizing our influence 
I rather suspect it might have the opposite effect by reducing the extent to which others are uh, dependent um, on us. I mean, if one takes the extreme kind of case of the United States and North Korea, surely an ethic of self-reliance in which there is zero contact between the two countries is much more costly to North Korea than it is to the United States and does much more to magnify American influence than it does uh, Northern, North Korean uh, influence. So I think we have to be rather careful in uh, how, we, uh, how we frame uh, all, of, uh, all of this. But at the same time, I think there is uh, no question um, about how this should be viewed. Um, a very interesting historical study for somebody to do, and I have no feeling for what it would, what the conclusion would be, is it was a central theme of American policy pre the early 1970s to uh, reduce our dependence on foreign energy in a variety of ways through the activities of the Texas Railroad uh, Commission, through a variety of um, oil import fees and discussions. Whatever it is we did, I think it's fair to say it didn't work out so well. And I don't know which, I, I honestly don't know which of the policies that are being advocated now echo those mistakes and which reflect the learning of uh, those lessons. So I guess my ultimate comment is more a comment that there's a lot of need for rethinking and careful data analysis uh, in this area. Thanks a lot, Larry. Uh, if I may, uh, just this very very quick follow-up question for you before we enter into the geopolitical uh, dimension of the problem. Uh, what's your view on friend shoring uh, that was proposed by Janet Yellen? I, I assume uh, given your comments so far, it's not very positive, but uh, it's, it's a good bridge towards uh, the, the next phase so, of our conversation. So one question, So I don't, so I'm not sure what friend shoring exactly means. Um, Harvard University is involved in the production of educational services. If friend shoring means that we should shy away from either welcoming students from countries that are more adversarial to the United States, or it means we should be more hesitant about offering executive education courses or engaging in partnerships with countries that are more hostile to the United States. It strikes me that it is probably a misguided, uh, ad misguided admonition. If you asked me, uh, to advise a company that I was on the board of, would I be more skeptical of their locating a production facility in Russia than I would have been 12 months ago? Of course. If you ask me, should the government be using the tools of policy to tell companies where to uh, locate? Should there be tax incentives for locating production in countries that are thought to be more allied with the United States at a particular moment rather than uh, less allied, I guess I'd be rather skeptical of uh, that policy. I would note that there were all kinds of efforts that had rather the feel of friendshoring to promote bilateral US economic activity 
between the United States and Iran prior to uh, the Shah's fall in 1979. And I don't think those were a great success of US economic policy. So should a ra- if you ask me, should a rational company take account of geopolitical reality as it locates production facilities? Of course. Should it be a broad strategic objective of US uh, public policy to decide who our fr- who's more of a friend of ours and who's less of a friend of ours and push people to uh, locate uh, in those places. I'd want to see the policy defined much more carefully before I moved in favor of uh, initiatives in uh, that uh, direction. Frankly, this strikes me as an area where the um, rhetoric and the choice of attractive phrases has run rather ahead of uh, deep analysis. And let me say, I am really quite open-minded on this. And it may well be that I'm, uh, that a set of arguments will be presented, or for that matter, that a set of arguments have been presented that I'm just not familiar, just not uh, familiar with. But I just think we need to be very careful about thinking this through. Yeah, thanks a lot. Jeffrey, you raise your hand. I don't know if you want to react to this. Or... Yeah, I just, yeah, what Larry had to say was quite interesting as always, but I have a question on the, the French sharing thing. Uh, do, would you agree that the Germans made a mistake in becoming so dependent on Russian uh, natural gas uh, over the last 10 years? And are there certain areas for the U.S. like uh, rare earth uh, minerals that it would be worth uh, having some government uh, role to, to make sure we had sources that were friendly countries? So I, I think it's reasonable. I think it's reasonably clear in retrospect that uh, the Russians be, that the that the Germans became overly dependent on natural gas. And I think that it is probably, it probably was reasonably clear in prospect that uh, they were making a mistake. Whether that is best read, whether that episode is best read in the way that it tends to be read as an argument for conscious public policies to override markets in order to reduce dependence, or whether that is best read as reflecting misguided public policies directed at building relations with Russia and seeking temporary and seeking economic advantage in that way, I think is an open question. I'm not sure. I think that Though that dependence is as much a manifestation of German industrial policy as it is an event that makes a case for German industrial policy. I think in the rare earths area, which I have um, a bit of familiarity with, I think we need to be quite careful. Sometimes it is said that we are dependent on a rare earth and that that's a critical problem. But what the situation actually is, is that that rare earth comprises half a percent of the value of an automobile. And that the next most attractive supplier of that rare earth will charge three times as much as the supplier on whom we're currently relying, therefore adding 1% to the cost of uh, the vehicle. So I think we do need uh, to be very aware of strategic uh, dependence that exposes us substantially to the leverage of others. But I think it is the contribution of economists to 
point out that there is more malleability and flexibility of economic systems to adapt themselves to shocks uh, than tends to be the instinct of uh, others. There's a whiff, I think more than a whiff, of what I might call Jay Forrester, Dennis Meadows kind of economics in uh, these discussions of uh, scarcity uh, and raw materials. But again, there may well be cases we actually we absolutely uh, should uh, be uh, should be looking at them, but I think we need to be we need to be aware and we need to look at historical examples of success as well as uh, examples of uh, failure. I think in general when we probably should have a larger strategic petroleum reserve and we should probably have a more systematic policy that when the current price exceeds the future price, we sell with a commitment to buy back forward. And the fact that we've got it designed right now in a way where there's a question as to whether it's legal to systematically buy back uh, using the forward market uh, is an example of where I think we probably could have sensible, more market-oriented uh, policies. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Larry. And uh, building on what Jeffrey was mentioning, ironically, Europe's uh, dependence on Russian gas uh, is actually the the result of an attempt uh, of building resilience back in the seventies, because uh, as a result of the oil shocks. Uh, uh, Europe decided to move towards uh, natural gas uh, because it seemed to be a safer way to reduce dependence on Middle Eastern uh, production. So uh, with the benefit of insight, uh, probably these sort of um, policies after a few years, uh, decades, don't really uh, pay out as expected. So maybe we can go back uh, to uh to 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 our plan of the discussion and uh maybe uh jeffrey um going back to this idea of uh, uh international uh, uh, fragmentation how do you see the implication in terms of cooperation to address uh, uh, what like uh, key global issues from climate change or future pandemics, uh, financial stability, and so on. Do you think uh, this process of deglobalization will have an impact on that, or they, we will find a way to strike a balance between these different forces? Well, I think it's, it's right to ask about fragmentation, and if we've got a pause or even reversal in globalization, it's, it's, it's natural to ask whether the world will be breaking up into uh, regional trade blocks uh, reminiscent of the 1930s, which is a very cautionary tale. I don't see any reason uh, why it should break up into lots of trade blocks. Uh, I can see an argument for it breaking up into two, one centered on U.S. and Europe and the other centered on uh, uh, led by Russia and China. And that would essentially be a return to the Cold War of uh, 1946 to 1990, 91, um, which, you know, is often considered a period of relative stability and cooperation, uh, is cooperation among the countries of what we used to call the, the uh, free world. Um, there were some important mishaps along the way, but I think that... Uh, uh, in, in retrospect, at least, uh, that that was a uh, era that to be, uh, I don't want to say aspired to, but it was an area of cooperation. Um, and maybe we want to move back in that direction. Now, there's major differences, of course. I can think of two really important ones. One is the size of China's economy uh, is very important in, in the world, which wasn't the case uh, during the Cold War, or nor was it the case of the Soviet Union uh, being so important economically or uh, let alone so integrated in the West. And the other is the prominence of some critical cross-border issues. You, you mentioned pandemics and climate change. Those are the two most obvious ones that are uh, they're not entirely new, but we didn't worry about them much during the Cold War. And uh, they, do, they do call for international cooperation. 
one can imagine uh, uh, muddling through on some other international uh, issues uh, that, where cooperation would be ideal, like uh, financial, let's say, but it's not, not essential. But on pandemics and climate change, it seems to me close to essential to have the, uh, the cooperation. Um, so those two differences, uh, the size of China and the uh, nature of today's uh, external, global externalities, make international cooperation uh, more challenging this time around. On the plus side, uh, there is a silver lining to the tragedy in Ukraine, which is on this occasion, uh, we see evidence of a return to effective collaboration among the Western nations. And by Western nations, I mean to include Japan and others in Asia and the Pacific. Um, it's been said that cooperation requires a conductor of the international orchestra. And the problem with the interwar period is the UK had lost the ability to be the leader of the international orchestra and the US had not yet gained the, uh, the will. Um, if that, to the extent that's true, a problem of the last 20 years is that the US effectively abdicated this role uh, of uh, international leadership along with the, the soft power, I would say, uh, partially abdicated it after 2001 and totally abdicated it from 2017 to 2020. So uh, there is a sign, the silver lining is uh, the glimmer of hope is successful US leadership of the West has been manifest in the response to the invasion of uh, Ukraine. An optimistic view is that that will uh, continue. A pessimistic view is that it will only last till the next US elections. Thanks, uh, thanks Jeffrey. And uh, Meg, uh, um... Building on what uh, Jeffrey was saying about this uh, world split into blocks, uh, the West and China, uh, do you think that uh, Xi Jinping is trying, is pushing and emphasizing self-reliance because he really wants to, to build a sort of China block or he wants just to insulate the country and the China block is just China without anything else? So do we, exp is, is it a sort of, uh, is, is an isolated China, to put it differently, is uh, a restrained power or a truculent one? So how do you see it? China's intentions are, um, are, are difficult and I'm, I, I kind of, um, I, I stand with the, <laughs> the idea that it's, you know, it's one thing to say we know what China's intentions might be now. It's very difficult to say that. Um, I'm not sure I'd be willing to say what China's intentions are vis-a-vis -vis the global order, but then you know, imagining what they might be in five or 10 years is also extremely difficult, if not impossible. And so, um, I mean, I, I've, I've enjoyed this exchange, especially about self-reliance and friend shoring and how we think about it. And, you know, it's Larry's job as the economist to tell us that markets are resilient. And as a political scientist, you know, it's worth, it's worth you know, wondering, what do we mean by our friends, right, when we, um, when we say that? And so there's this big you know, sense sometimes, and the Biden administration is currently framing a lot of what's going on both in Ukraine, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Russia and with China in terms of democracy versus authoritarianism. And, you know, especially during the Trump administration, the drive to exclude Huawei um, and to exclude Chinese vendors from 5G networks was very much about that as well. So the attempt was this clean network, which would have distinguished between, you know, clean supply chains, which really are, are clean based on what they thought of, you know, the trust principles of whether uh, the government, right, where those vendors are from is a democracy or not. And I would say, you know, I think that's a mistake, right, to see. And, and so, you know, Jeffrey was saying there's differences between the Cold War and now, and certainly the ones he highlighted are, are, are the ones I go to as well. Um, but also when we think about, you know, what does it mean, right, to have a trading block led by China? So it's my view that China is ambivalent about other places' political systems. It doesn't want to replicate its political system. In fact, Xi Jinping and the CCP think that the Chinese political system is unique. It's, it's a meritocratic one-party system that has predictable alternation in power, at least used to. And they think that that is unique to China and that most countries can't really do it. And so I don't see this kind of effort on the part of China to project its own political system. Instead, it wants what, you know, the political scientist Jessica Chen Wise has said, a world safe for its own autocracy, right? So for it to practice its own form of political system. And so 
you know, in, in the effort to figure out, you know, how are we safe with different supply chains? And, you know, to Larry's question about, you know, should companies think about geopolitics? Yes, but should they make the decision to only, for example, source from democracies? It doesn't necessarily seem to me that that makes us any safer at all. And in fact, when we think about, you know, you ask about China's influence in the world and what, you know, China wants to do, you know, you have countries from Sri Lanka to Pakistan to Kenya to Ethiopia, you know, who are saying, look, you know, we haven't had foreign direct investment in this country in decades. We haven't had infrastructure construction in this country in decades. They're not stupid, the leaders of those countries. They know there are trade-offs with accepting Chinese financing or welcoming Chinese foreign direct investment, Chinese companies, right? But they're 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 smart enough, right, to sometimes val you know make those cost benefit analyses, or at least they're undertaking them. I don't know that I would agree with every decision that anyone makes. But if the United States and you know the West broadly settle on an idea, right, that it's only safe to trade with democracies. I think that's really alienating to a lot of the world where democracies are fragile or uncertain or processes of political change are underway in various ways. Um, and so, and it doesn't seem like the right way um, to think about building a world um, where basically, you know, supply chains are a little more resilient, but also that other countries, right, think that they have a place to participate um, in globalization, whether in institutions or in, you know, cross-border ideas, information, capital goods, you know, that will benefit them. If it's only a club of the rich and, and the, the free, you know, defined by some people who are allowed to engage in globalization, it doesn't seem to me that gets us, you know, the best markets or necessarily the best influence in the world. And so, um, so I, I, I feel like that's, that's somewhere where I feel very strongly, but, but reading into, I mean, Xi Jinping wants a world where China can rise. That's what he wants. And I don't think he cares what other countries' political systems are at all. If they're as long as they allow China to be China, um, and my view is we should allow China to be China. I mean, if we if we decide that we're in a world where you know we're willing to you know to use terms from um, some political scientists, you know, weaponize every supply chain to make sure no Chinese company gets any chip for any purpose, right? Then that only sends a message that you know the, that there's no world in which the United States can accept China's rise or the West can accept China's rise, and then you you kind of generating even more of these insecurity and panic dynamics that have been that have been negative so far. And so you know, we're, we're in a, I, it's, it's a very difficult place we're all in right now in terms of thinking about trust and reciprocity, right? But if there's a way to, to settle on, you know, some elements of some guardrails around what supply chains, um, you know, can be open to participation for, for everybody. And to do that, my view would be from a kind of technical industry standards way, especially with things like 5G, um, you know, doing it in, in that way but from international standards rather than from a kind of political prescription. Um, I think that would probably be in, in the interest of both the United States and the many, many countries that are looking to the club of wealthy, you know, free countries and saying, eventually I want in. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about my, my panelists, my co-panelists reactions to, to those ideas. Yeah, thanks a lot. They are very, very interesting. And in a way, what you're saying about uh, um, keeping a global value chain open is related to another idea that basically self-reliance does not coincide with self-sufficiency. Because in complex modern economies, you will always uh, need to have access to certain raw materials, certain regions of the world. And if you no longer have a market that mediates this transaction, you will need the coercive tools to, to, to get access to, to, to them. And so, I mean, this is uh, uh, my last question to, 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 to the panel be before we pick a question from the audience. And uh, Larry, uh, building on what Meg said, uh, given your interest uh, in uh, the China-US uh, uh, relationship, how would you react to her comments? What do you think the US, uh, how do you think the US should approach a China that is becoming self-reliant, probably also a bit self-isolated. Let me make uh, three, ob three observations, if I could, Eduardo. I found myself very impressed by and sympathetic with uh, things that uh, Meg was saying. First, I think everybody likes to talk about World War I as an analogy with respect to Thucydides' trap, all that with respect to the rise of China, I think World War II in the Pacific, 
and the effect of economic sanctions in the United States, as United, as imposed by the United States on Japan, is also an analogy that is worth uh, careful consideration. Second, let me read you something. Um, if we really want to slow down China's rate of innovation, we need to work with Europe. We have to work with our European allies so to deny China the most advanced technology so that they can't catch up to critical areas like semiconductors. That statement was made a year ago by Gina Raimondo, who is regarded as one of the most progressive integrationist forces within the Biden uh, administration. And when she said it, it was regarded as such a familiar proposition that no one much noticed. And no one, to my knowledge in America, rose to be critical of the comment. If you are sitting in Beijing, how can you not think that we are seeking to contain them, limit them, and uh, all of uh, that? It is uh, hard uh, to understand. So I think the point about uh, paranoia and our inducing uh, paranoia is very much uh, right. One does not need to believe that they are the good guys to believe that we are systematically and repeatedly making mistakes of being excessively uh, provocative. And I think that is a central insight for thinking about uh, the geopolitics. The last thing uh, I would say is, and this is again, uh, echoing, uh, echoing Meg's very thoughtful comment. Um, we had as a, our central strategic grouping, a summit of what we called the democracies and what we saw as our team in this coming struggle. We did not invite Singapore. That is saying something quite profound to uh, Asia. And we just need to think very carefully it seems to me about what our approach, uh, uh, what our approach uh, is. Uh, I have, over time, um, in response to uh, discouraging lessons, um, seen my views uh, evolve more in the direction of our Harvard colleague, Steve Waltz, um, in taking a realist kind of uh, approach. It gives me, it gives me uh, little pleasure, but I think one has to try to see the world as it is rather than as one wants it to be. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, and Jeffrey, do you want to react to this bit of a conversation on China and what the US, uh, how the US uh, should approach it in this context? I, I, I can react briefly, uh, try, try to react briefly. Um, first on the Thucydides trap, the proposition that uh, when a, there's a rising economic power or, or military power, uh, the, the, the chance that it'll come into conflict, military conflict with an existing status quo, uh, great power is, uh, is unusually large, if not 100%. Uh, I think that proposition hasn't really been tested in Graham Allison's uh, very uh, best-selling book, I think. Um, he, just, he counts the number of times that uh, a, a rising power came into conflict with a status quo power relative to the total number of times there was a rising power. But it seems to me that needs a control, which is all the cases, I mean, great powers fought wars all the time, 
need to control, which is if both countries are, are great powers, what's the chance that they'll fight a war? Maybe that's, maybe that's a quibble. Um, on Larry's uh, point about uh, uh, provoking paranoia in uh, China, I, I, I really agree with that. And I, uh, it's maybe strange for an economist to say, but I think that we've put way too much uh, emphasis in our demands on China over the years on economic uh, demands, many of which didn't make much sense, like regarding the Renmin, value of the renminbi, or um, maybe some of our demands were maybe in China's own interests, like uh, de-emphasizing state-owned enterprises, uh, large enough state enterprises, and moving more reliance on the private sector. Um, I think we should have put more emphasis on things like uh, help, seeking their help in dealing with North Korea, where it's a very important issue at stake, and there's a lot of grounds for cooperation without without threatening uh, without threatening them. Maybe it may be too late, or maybe it locked into this uh, struggle for dominance that both countries perceive. So maybe that that's is, uh, too late. Just on, on realism, um, I don't know. I've always thought that the IPR people, international uh, political relations people. Uh, do too much of an absolute division between uh, realism and, and uh, non-realists. Uh, the right answer, of course, is to be realistic about what other countries will likely do or what you yourself can do, but also to uh, pursue some lofty uh, objectives uh, subject to those constraints. I don't think we have to choose. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, it's a it's very interesting conversation. Uh, we are actually a bit short of time because uh, our 60 minutes are about to expire in one minute. I hope you have two, three more minutes to stay on uh, and referring to our panelists. Um, I would like just to pick uh, uh, one question for uh, Meg from the audience because uh, there are a few people who ask in different way, basically the same question. And uh, the question is, uh, which industries are China uh, positioned to be the most self-sufficient in? This is the one that probably summarizes many others. So Meg, over to you. I wish I could claim to be an expert on all of these industries and how the supply <laughs> chains work, but I don't want to overestimate um, my expertise on it. I mean. You know, the semiconductor um, weakness in China is quite visible, right? And, um, and we've seen, you know, various Chinese corporates take huge hits over the last couple of years as those supply chains have become less accessible to them. Um, and so, you know, that, so it seems, and, you know, I, I talk with the semiconductor industry people quite frequently, and there's a lot of, you know, pessimism that, you know, how, how long it takes really to catch up and, and making chips that are, you know, basically doubling in intensity as per Moore's law every, every, every year um, or every two years. It's, it's quite, um, I, I'm a little pessimistic for their ability to catch up, catch up just with the complexity of that particular supply chain. Um, it's also, you know, worth mentioning that, you know, the China, and I, I guess if I could, you know, give people some guidance to think how to think about it rather than some predictions, which is that China knows that half of what it does and its industrial policy will fail. It understands that there's going to be fraud and waste in many of the renminbi spent on many of these ventures. And so we have this tendency, you know, to pick up a couple of stories about fantastic failures and, you know, semiconductors and other things and say, well, none of this stuff is gonna work in China. Um, but in fact, you know, a lot of what they end up doing is muddling through in different ways. And so I would say, you know, the semiconductor problem is real. The area where, you know, they're, they're gonna make a lot of gains. And here I would point um, the audience's attention to my colleague David Yang in the um, economics department doing some fascinating work on just a development of AI. And what China has that, that we don't have and that a lot of places don't have is access to a tremendous amount of data. And firms have access to a tremendous amount of data. And so it seems like some interesting thinking ought be required um, on the part of standards and transnational associations on data management. Um, to think about basically how do we how do we think about you know this this transformation to a, a, a you know a high volume data world and what firms can learn from that um, because the, the the AI developments in China are really are really quite amazing and I and I you know agree with Larry it does, it's not about crippling China or overcoming China right but what are the ways in which we can think creatively um, about how that works um, 
but I, but I wish I could answer the question with some sort of certainty about where they're self-sufficient and where they're not. Instead, I would just say as a framework, you should understand that they muddle through in a lot of what they do and they are tolerant of a lot of waste, a lot of fraud and a lot of failure. And so don't read too much into individual data points from that perspective. And thanks a lot, a very, very effective uh, answer. Larry, if you may, uh, one very quick question for you, in, in part you, you already answered. Um, it's about uh, supply chain uh, diversification. And basically uh, Charles is asking uh, what in your opinion are the main constraint for such diversification? Is it political constraint, capacity of firms to operate with different suppliers or for instance, infrastructure. I have an instinct, I may be wrong, I may well be completely wrong about this, but I actually think that um, somebody once said to me that the only thing that causes people to change their behavior in important ways is pain. And I think something like that is perhaps true with respect to economic systems. And so I think that the dislocations and difficulties of the last several years are likely to cause a uh, great deal to change as a consequence of uh, natural uh, corporate behavior. So I'm not sure that there are uh, major constraints uh, that uh, need to be uh, need to need to be removed, um, but I am troubled, and I don't have a good answer to um, the degree of dependence that the world has on Taiwan or semiconductors. That does seem like a not good place to be, but the kind of industrial policies that would be pursued if one sought to imagine all the things that could go wrong and counter them, would I suspect also have uh, quite a substantial uh, uh, would also have uh, quite substantial costs. I think I'd go back to uh, the line I used uh, before about uh, we need generals. We absolutely do, but the best generals are the ones that hate war. And if, but if you hate war, you're not so likely to become a general. And I think there's very much that problem with respect to uh, industrial policy. And as, I th as we think about what a Center for Business and Government at Harvard can do, or what a um, business and government in the international economy at the Harvard Business School uh, can do, it seems to me thinking about these problems is a very valuable thing. Thanks a lot, Larry. Uh, in the interest of time, I would like to pick one final question for Jeffrey before we close and before people uh, claim that the Italian moderator mess up the timeline and the schedule for everyone. So uh, Jeffrey, there is one question for you on uh, regionalization. And basically uh, Eric is asking, uh, uh, summarizing uh, whether this is not this current context does not provide an opportunity for uh, the US to integrate more uh, uh, continentally here with uh, uh, Canada, Mexico, and maybe also Latin America. Well, I think that's right. And this is uh, relevant to the question of uh, friend shoring and uh, the idea that if we break up into blocks, it's not going to be lots of blocks, but be two blocks. Uh, the le length of supply chains, when we say length, we, we usually mean metaphorically the number of steps in it, but it's also true geographically that if we have for sourcing from Mexico uh, or Canada, that is uh, able to respond much more quickly. Uh, as we've seen the problems with the ports. Uh, and uh, uh, so I think that there is a lot of promise for Mexico in particular and uh, Latin America in general to uh, take advantage of the uh, 
the uh, end of the of the Chinese uh, miracle when it comes to the, its role in global trade and to uh, integrate with the U.S. Thanks a lot. Um, so I want to thank uh, Meg, uh, Larry, and Jeffrey for your time and your insight. I, thought, I think it was a very fascinating conversation. Uh, so I wish also good luck uh, to the students uh, who are connected on their finals uh, and enjoy your graduation if that's the case. Have a nice weekend, uh, everyone, and thanks for joining. Bye-bye. Uh,